So this is the panel section uh, where we're going to ask a few questions to um, the panelists here. Um, I think it's going to put it 20 minutes, so I'll, I'll try to keep it as quickly as I can in terms of trying to cover as much ground as we can. Um, so first, um, over the last few years, we've seen deep learning um, make a big impact on um, vision and computer vision. So uh, it's a combination of uh, data, it's a combination of compute, and it's a, it's a lot of the combination of the algorithms which you are developing over the last uh, few years. Um, so if I were to ask you, what is one area where um, one innovation uh, you are most excited about today? And also, one if you had a magic wand, what is one innovation you wish had happened uh, to take this uh, uh, the whole ecosystem one step forward? So if you can answer both those questions, each of you. Are we talking uh, in the context of video understanding still, or yeah, are we talking in, in, in the, the context, context of video of understanding? Yeah. Okay, no. um, so one area that I'm, I'm super excited about is uh, we see video as a as a requiring more compute, uh, but if we do it well, at least intuitively, it seems like it should be less compute, because video is inherently showing you where to look at, uh, depending on the task, and so so I'm really excited about models that can actually be faster uh, uh, and better by using uh, motion as a cue or uh, attention as a cue. There is definitely a lot of effort on this, pub pub publications on this, but nothing uh, that has been significantly proven that actually video is not a compute-bound thing. It's actually useful. We can do real time. Right? I'm super excited about that, because that can open up a lot more doors. And, and what is one area where you, th you wish people had worked on it? and? Um it make your life much easier? I think, uh, I mean, there are many areas, right? One is uh, related to the infrastructure that I pointed out, which is uh, distributed training and so on. But that points to large scale data sets. The other area I feel is uh, modeling attention, uh, modeling motion uh, in a, in a mathematically. Uh, so I think the core models itself, we don't necessarily know whether we should be aggregating at the final level, which is the late fusion, or aggregating at the lower level, which is the early fusion. There are a bunch of uh, these open questions. So I think there is some work that needs to be done on the models. Uh, uh, for me, you know, as, as I mentioned uh, uh, just in the talk, I'm really excited about the, the, the problem of uh, uh, product placement. Not that, I, I, that I'm interested in the placement itself, but I think, you know, a, a, a 3D understanding of uncontrolled videos, uh, which posing a lot of different uh, computer vision technologies, like structure of motion, single view 3D understanding, and other things. That's something that's quite exciting for me personally. Uh, as of something that I, I, I wish could happen, uh, I, you know, I, I, I still feel that you know, video, video uses a lot more compute. <laughs> so I, I wish you know, someone can actually uh, take care of that for me. You know, we, have, we have done a lot of, uh, pe people in the community have done a lot of work in terms of compressing models and speeding up models, but I like to see uh, if there's you know, a, a well-packaged uh, hardware solution that we can, we can use for, for a new video analysis. So from my side, uh, I think one of the, I think video is still largely untapped as a source of knowledge. And I think that we're just scratching the surface in terms of learning from video. Uh, I think uh, we've seen progress in this area, but I think it's still early days. Um, and uh, I mean, I agree that many of the, uh, with many of the points that both Xiaofeng and uh, Manor brought up, but I feel that uh, maybe we're not really, you know, attacking video the right way yet. And I'm still quite dissatisfied with the, uh, with the architectures that we use to process video. Um, so I think images, we've done a good job. Video, not so much yet. Cool. So just switching gears a little bit, I think we've seen a lot of good applications of video. Um, there's a company which was recently acquired by John Deere, which used to, um, like, thin lettuce, uh, Blue River Systems. And then we're looking at surveillance. We're looking at a lot of different applications for video. Um, but uh, as we discussed before, I think a lot of it is mostly classification problems. Uh, what are some of the good problems you have seen which go beyond classification and also action recognition? Um, can you give some examples where you have seen uh, which uh, you're excited about? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, one example that uh, uh, Rahul alluded to was thumbnail, but I think it's just the beginning. Uh, the real, the real uh, problem is summarization. But, but both academic community and industry are kind of, uh, we, we don't know how to measure ourselves, whether we are making progress. So, so it's kind of like a two-step uh, problem. One is the task. 
but the other way is the measurement, uh, uh, are we making progress? So keeping that in context, I think summarization would be really, really nice, especially if you go a step further, summarization of content across billions of people uh, talking about the topic. So if, if I wake up today and I, I go to Facebook and I want to talk about some th event that has happened, I know that many, many uh, photos and image, uh, videos have been shared about it, but I want to summarize that in either a chronological way or a systematic way, a semantic way uh, that can tell the story from multiple perspectives. I think that's a very difficult problem. We could do some hacky job at it by using the existing algorithms, but I don't think we have a good way to measure. And also, there is a lot more progress that we need to, we need to do uh, uh, in the models, right? That could be one example. I don't want to take too much time. Uh, I, I'll let the other two panelists give other examples. All right, just to shake things up, I'll go next, I guess. Um, so I think when we talk about video, I think there's actually a bit of confusion in the community. There's two types of videos, at least. There's the kind of video that uh, people create for others to watch, but there's also a sense of the streams of frames that are coming in, particularly on systems like robots, in interactive systems, and so on. And right now, we seem to treat them identically when we're thinking about this video. I think it's a mistake. I think the two serve different needs. Um, and especially this notion of kind of whole video classification type thing, it disappears when you, uh, when you switch modes. Um, I think one of the reasons we focus so much on classification regression was that there were well-known problems we could apply for images, but I think for video, we need to think differently. Uh, we need to understand the role of time uh, and, and, and so on. And so we are seeing, uh, I mean, we are, we are seeing things that go beyond a classification uh, and regression in things like dense prediction, generation synthesis, uh, sorts of things. But I you know, still think uh, in terms of video, we haven't really uh, grappled with the problem as well as we should have. So these are very good points. I want to add, add one thing is that, you know, uh, back in those days, uh, some people believe that a lot of the human perception is bootstrapped from motion signals. So we used to joke when we were, we were graduate students that we should all just work on motion segmentation and solve it and come back to all the other things. I like to see uh, you know, us spending more time thinking about, at least thinking about video segmentation and, and the grouping to see how that helps. Yeah. And uh, you shared a video, Rahul, about um, the uh, video summarization, and then you talked about it as well. Um, my version of video summarizing like an hour of football game is going to be very different than somebody else's. And so it's a, a lot of it is personal um, uh, in terms of um, user. Um, each user has different preferences. And it's very hard to find even a thumbnail in that case, which is um, so one question I think is like, what are the right metrics without humans uh, in the loop uh, in terms of um, how you compare summarization of system X versus system Y uh, without having humans to kind of rate the summarization? I will start this up. So I, I fully agree. I think that a lot of we have been lax in terms of person, uh, this personalization, I think, is very, very key. So for example, I go scuba diving and I take a lot of underwater footage. I might want to see you know, some aspects of it, but other people may want completely different aspects. And others may just be happy to see you know, one frame with the shark that was you know, behind me or whatever. Um, so I think the notion of uh, this personalization is hard. And I think part of what you're alluding to is that in some tasks, like classification, there's a clear yes, no answer. In many of these other ones, it may either be subjective or very, very context specific. Um, let me try to ease up to an easier problem, maybe. Let's take something like uh, compression, say video compression or image compression. There, you may want to reduce the number of visual artifacts. And right now, the best way to identify it may still be to get someone to look at it and say, OK, well, is the A better than B? Um, one could imagine, however, if you got data of that sort, maybe it's possible to train a neural net to do that task. So maybe it's not a personalized task. But maybe it's an aesthetic task that's still ill-posed, but for which you can collect data. You could imagine training a network and then backpropping through that as your loss function. Uh, so in terms of the metric, you know, as Andrew mentioned this morning, one of the characteristics of an uh, internet company is, you know, being able to do A-B testing. So that's usually uh, a very direct way you can, you can measure uh, the, 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 the effectiveness of, of something. So I would say, you know, uh, whenever we can, we should do that. Yeah, I mean, uh, Rahul nailed it in the sense that some of these are so subjective that uh, quantifying them, like even the PSNR ratio on compression might not be the right uh, metric. Blue score in translation or captioning might not be the right metric, right? But uh, finding those surrogate losses, 
uh, without humans is actually as big a challenge as uh, coming up with a model for these problems uh, in some sense. So uh, one way I feel is, uh, especially for systems that are being used by many, many people, uh, we could tech definitely do some sort of testing, right? Which is like, hey, is this compression uh, better than this uh, uh, by testing it on 100 people uh, in a closed set and 100 people uh, who are not, you know, so at, a, at larger scales, of course. So that could be one way. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's definitely one of the challenges. Yeah, so speaking of humans in the loop, I don't know how many uh, people in the audience are aware that for every machine that needs to be trained, there's an army of people who are drawing bounding boxes, right? So there's, there's farms of people who are just drawing uh, boxes. We invested in a company which um, is trying to automate a little bit of that, um, but um, we still see that there is going to be a lot of humans which are needed to train the systems. Um, from your point of view, I think uh, the holy grail is not to have a lot of data to train uh, systems, but uh, it seems like a necessary evil. So the question is, um, what are you seeing uh, both in practice and in research where uh, you can try to train the systems more and more without, with fewer and fewer humans needed to train the systems? I guess if you want to go first. Yeah, yeah I can go first uh, you know, about the practice. Uh, as, as I mentioned, in many cases, what we try to do is to leverage the, uh, the user data, you know, the user clicks, what they like, what they don't like, and let it feed back uh, uh, into the, in the system. Uh, sometimes it can be uh, quite effective. So I guess I can make three points. One is absolutely there are armies of people who are annotating data. And one thing that uh, I think it's important for us to do, and we're seeing good efforts both from Facebook, Google, and others, is to actually share that data. Once it's annotated, we want to make it available to researchers outside. So then now that someone's gone through the hard work of doing it, you know, more people can benefit from it. Um, so that's one. Second is to do more with kind of self-supervised type techniques where it is possible uh, to gain some insights without the human annotator. Um, I'm not actually a fan of unsupervised learning. I'm not seeing very much coming from purely unsupervised techniques. I do believe weak supervision, self-supervision gets us places. Um, and then um, the, uh, yeah, and then the third, I guess, is to identify cases where, as Xiaofeng said, you know, there are users in the loop in some sense that are providing feedback. And many of the systems right now are live launched and they do react to the feedback that actual users give. Yeah, uh, actually, I'm going to cite, uh, so we organized a workshop uh, on vision and language just uh, three days ago at ICCV in Venice. And uh, Antonio Toralba, who's from MIT, uh, gave a very bold statement. I'm going to just cite it. He said, humans are the weakest link right now in building AI systems. And, and, and he's backing it up with uh, basically saying uh, there are many, many humans who are annotating things that the machine is consuming and building the models, and now you're taking those biases, you're taking all of that noise the, of explaining what you want to do to humans who are sitting somewhere else in the world and who understand the task in some way and then give annotations in some way, and then you take, and the machine learning amplifies those biases even more, right? So uh, some points have already been made, but one point that I feel is uh, instead of thinking of it as an end-to-end -end learning, you're breaking the problem as to learning a reasonable generalized representation from noisy data, from uh, weakly supervised data, and then taking very small amounts of supervised data to use these representations for the new task. I think that is a very promising direction that's already working, that, that I think we should invest even more. And the second one that we haven't touched is the multi-model. There is a lot of value that you're getting from audio for vision problems. There's a lot of value that you're getting from text for vision problems and video vision to text and vision to translation, right? So we, I feel like uh, we haven't done enough uh, in terms of uh, posing these problems as multi-model and really doing a good job of uh, learning from multiple modalities. So that, that could be one way to reduce the dependency on annotations and supervision. Awesome. I, I don't think we have any more time for questions. Uh, some of the topics we wanted, we wanted to cover but didn't have time were role of silicon and um, other infrastructure needed for um, moving the video annotation forward. But do you have any last comments about what we can expect from each of your companies in terms of uh, video and computer vision? I mean, we are working on multiple fronts. Uh, video uh, in the context of understanding video for uh, communication, like making sure we understand the video and connect it to the right people at the right time uh, for search, for feed, for uh, AR and VR experience. So uh, everything else has been spoken about already. There's 
big surprises, and if there were, I cannot talk about them. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, we have many things. We will try, try to make them work better. Uh, for my personal side, uh, I mean, I'm a roboticist, and I actually want to see uh, us moving further away from passive vision into more active kinds of systems, and I'd love to see that happen. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for the panelists for um, speaking about all the research um, they're working in their companies and also maybe giving us a glimpse about what we can expect in the coming weeks, months, and years. So uh, give it up for the three uh, panelists here. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. Thank you.